The information in this broadcast is for educational purposes only and is not provided as a professional service, medical advice, or is it intended or implied to be a substitute for diagnosis or treatment. You are encouraged to confirm any information obtained from this broadcast with other sources and review all information regarding any medical condition or treatment with your physician and other appropriate health care providers. Hi, I'm Pete Levine. Welcome to Noggins and Neurons, Stroke and TBI Recovery Simplified. I'm a clinical instructor and clinical researcher. I've co-authored dozens of scientific journal articles about brain injury recovery, and I'm also the author of the book, Stronger After Stroke. I'm Deborah Battistella, occupational therapist, creator of the OT's Guide to Mirror Therapy, and an OT educator. I have a lot of experience working with survivors. Most of my clinical practice has been in a certified stroke center. Pete and I are especially interested in talking about what rehab, neuroscience, and clinical research all have to say about the brain and recovery. But don't worry, our job is to make this stuff simple. We're here to make it so that everyone, clinicians, clinical students, caregivers, and most importantly, the survivor, understands what it takes to leverage their great neuroplastic brain for recovery. This podcast began with both Pete and I, two kindred souls with a passion for moving the recovery process forward. If you've started listening more recently, say since the beginning of 2022, you likely noticed that Pete is absent from conversations. This is because he had a rather unexpected and abrupt departure from this earthly plane. Pete's voice remains in the intro in reverence to and respect for his part of our joint vision for this project. Simply put, it wouldn't be where it is today, nor have a future without him. Now, on to another great conversation. Yes, I can see how that is such an easy um, fit to fall into because almost every interaction you're having outside of your social circle is addressing that condition or that new disability. So you think you have become that. It's very easy to forget that this new diagnosis, this new condition is a part of your life. It is not your whole life. In this episode of Noggins and Neurons, I have the good pleasure of speaking with Sujata Martin, owner of Pelvic Soul, Pelvic Therapy, and Sex Counseling. Her mission is to help people of all genders to find comfort and confidence through trauma-informed and evidence-based pelvic floor care. As a pelvic health occupational therapist, she uses a mind-body approach to treat the whole individual and not just their complaints. In addition to occupational therapy care, which includes skilled intervention for physical and mental health needs, the spirituality of Sujata's Eastern cultural upbringing reflects in her mind-body approach to treating pelvic floor conditions. In November of 2021, she was recognized by the New York State Occupational Therapy Association with the Merit in Practice Award for Pelvic Health. And Sujata is the primary clinical investigator in an active research study being conducted with West Coast University. Sujata also authored a book, Not Just Kegels, The Exhausted Mama's Guide to Pregnancy and Postnatal Wellness, that ranked number one on Amazon's pregnancy and childbirth list. On a more personal note, Sujata is a lover of coffee, binge-watching Netflix on the couch, and spending time exploring Tampa Bay with her family. You're in for a treat as Sujata sheds light on addressing challenges associated with sex and intimacy. Look for the links to her book and her website in the show notes. Enjoy. Sujata, thank you so much for being here joining me on the Noggins and Neurons podcast. I can't wait to hear about all that you've been up to because I know you've added to your practice since we last had a a lengthy conversation about what you do. 
can we talk about the pelvic floor practice that you have and then get into more of the sex therapy that you're sure. doing now? And yes. Let's see where this conversation takes us. Sounds wonderful. So thank you for having me, Debra. Um, a big hello to everyone listening. I'm Sujata Martin. I am a pelvic health occupational therapist that practices in Tampa, Florida. I own my own practice, which gives me wonderful freedom to tailor care as I and my clients see best, which is just such a gift as a clinician, but also honestly, such a gift for people who choose to work with me because we can work on anything. We can work on exercises one day. We can just figure out the intricacies of someone's interpersonal dynamics with their partner the other day. And we don't have to worry about billing codes or what insurance will reimburse and such and so on and so forth. So it's, it's really wonderful to have that kind of flexibility. That does sound nice. I was reading an article because this is an evidence-based podcast. So I was doing some research and all of these words that were jumping off of the page, policies and procedures. Um, oh my gosh, now I'm not going to be able to think of all the words that I just thought this doesn't sound like anything I want to talk about with my, my people that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. Let me see. It's, it's really all medicalized and yes. we, it's, it's almost like we, we have to be so medicinal or med medical that we mm -hmm. can't just be mm -hmm. people and talk about yes. real life people concerns. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a lot of dehumanization of people in medical care. And especially so for people who may have special needs, who may have disabilities and their sexuality, there is like a stripping away that, okay, this person may be in a wheelchair or they may have sustained a neurological injury, but at the end of the day, they are just Bob who likes to be intimate in such and such way, you know? Yes. Intimate. So, intimate is the key yes. word. And I know that a lot of times we equate sex with intimacy, mm -hmm. but it, there's so much yes. more to intimacy there is. and, mm -hmm. um, you know, sex is good too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So yes, that is again, one of the conversations I often find myself having. So just off the bat, um, to share a little bit about my practice and the kind of clients I'm seeing, I have been a pelvic health therapist since 2018. So about four years at the time, this podcast had been recorded. I have been treating sexual pain conditions for that time, but specifically counseling people regarding their sexual health and intimacy needs has been about a year, a year and a half. So a shorter timeline for sure. And also most individuals have been neurotypical um, with not significant special needs. I have had um, a client who was on the autism spectrum and um, exploring her sexuality and strengthening her sexual relationships and her intimate relationship with her boyfriend. But not, I don't specifically work with people with neurological deficits. Like that is not my only treatment focus, just to be clear. However, I work with people who have nerve injuries, like peripheral nerve injuries, due to which they may be having issues with erection. They may be having issues with orgasm. They may be having issues for women with like lubrication, just desire arousal, that's just across the board. So as occupational therapists, there is so much we can do in terms of just educating the individual about all the options they have what options they have available in the here and now, because just like you said, Debra, when people think intimacy, we think sex, and we think also just heterosexual sex. We also think sex of, in just one way. And I hope everyone listening today is an adult because we'll be using words like penis and vagina, but that's what... <laughs> Um, yeah, that's what we think of as just penis and vagina sex. Yeah. And when someone has sustained an injury or a life-changing medical condition or a diagnosis they have received, 
they find a lot of their identity stripped away because now they no longer fit in that small little box of penis and vagina sex. Like, hey, I can no longer do this. Mm -hmm. But there is so much more we can do, which is why I really enjoy that as an OT, I'm able to do this and bring so much more confidence back to people and just help them feel like themselves once more. Oh, there's so many things that... I want to make sure that we talk about. I love that you brought in confidence and identity because mm-hmm. that is a thing that I, I'm not sure that even we as occupational therapists or, or healthcare providers think about is the way that a person feels different when something has mm-hmm. occurred. And, mm-hmm. you know, especially following a stroke or acquired brain injury, that's a big change in someone's life. Mm -hmm. And I I just have a quick story. I was working with this woman years ago. She ended up having a stroke while she was engaging in sexual activity with her partner. Mm. And, you know, there was a little bit of trauma there. I mean, I think, I think Mm -hmm. stroke is a traumatic event anyway. So she had some Mm -hmm. trauma around that. And because of the setting that I worked in, I had the fortune, the good fortune to see people across the um, continuum of care. And I ended Mm -hmm. up working with her in acute care. And then I saw her again in the rehab unit and I was doing my basic occupational therapy thing of transfers and commodes. I was including commodes and she just looks at me and she goes, do I really have to use this thing? Because I'm going to tell you what, this is not sexy. (laughs) I was like, you're right. It's not sexy. No, Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to use this thing. So she didn't lose her identity of That's who she was in her relationship. And it, it actually helped me as a practitioner realize that I was being just a little too basic. Mm-hmm. Right. We, we bracket people as practitioners, even us with the best intentions, all of us in healthcare as healthcare providers, most of us, 95, 99% of us want to do a really good job. But the way our education is, Debra, just like you mentioned, it is, we see people in very, like sexuality is very, very rarely addressed. Very rarely addressed. One of the things Mm -hmm. that I, I kind of want to get back to basics a little bit before we get too deep Mm -hmm. in this conversation, because I see a lot of people questioning why occupational therapists would be addressing pelvic health. I know why we Mm -hmm. would, I know why we would be addressing sexuality. And Mm -hmm. so I did bring to this episode, the OT practice framework, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's an occupation. So it's an area of occupation. It's something that we do Mm -hmm. in our lives. And it's actually considered a basic activity of daily living. Now I can easily get into the instrumental activities of daily living, but on a basic level, sexual activity is there. It's one of the Mm -hmm. main occupations that people engage in and that Mm -hmm. we as OT practitioners are not often addressing with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we we can always take it so much further when we look at it in terms of instrumental ADLs, which Mm -hmm. I always define instrumental or IADLs as as those actions, those activities that require higher level thinking skills. Mm -hmm. So you've got health management. So personal device care, if people need a device there, it falls into a health management area. Sure. It can fall into uh, leisure activities as well. Mm -hmm. And yes. So if we, if we think about this a little bit more broadly, and help ourselves understand it, then, and maybe we could start doing a better service to our clients. Mm -hmm. And I, I, okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm gonna let you go. Sure. So there were like two pieces that jumped out at me, Deborah, from what you just shared. One was your initial question about how us occupational therapists can address pelvic health. Um, And the second piece seemed to be about 
how education on sexual health fits into occupational therapy practice or how to address that when addressing a person as they are recovering from any kind of neurological injury. Does that seem about right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So yes, first of all, occupational therapists don't treat one part of the body, right? We treat people. And oftentimes with whatever injury is involved, if it is a significant enough neurological injury or even a major orthopedic injury, oftentimes a pelvis is involved. And <clears throat> with specialized training, just like other practitioners, such as a physical therapist or an NP may choose to undertake through continuing education, occupational therapists are extremely competent in treating the functions of the structures in the pelvis. So everyday things that we think of as quote unquote regular OT, toileting, that is bowel and bladder management is something occupational therapists do day in, day out. That is almost the cornerstone of pelvic health, pain management, which a lot of therapists do in across settings is a major, major part of um, pelvic health rehab. And sexuality becomes a third piece. Sexuality, and I would say reproduction, Concep um, preconception and you know recovering from birth. That is again, I would say a subspecialty in pelvic health. A lot of us do it, not everyone does. So again, with the domain, um, the, the OT process and domain framework that you pulled up, Debra, it falls, pelvic health conditions cover almost all of it. It hits across all our occupations. Pelvic health dysfunction can affect rest and sleep. Now visualize someone who is recovering from a neurological injury. They probably don't, they may have bladder affectations in which their bladder is now neurogenic or they do not have control. They may need some kind of incontinent wear. They may have a cat um, that they self cat or they have one that's indwelling that affects their rest and sleep, that affects their social participation, their leisure. If we look at it from performance skills, so again, specific to the kind of person that is probably listening to this conversation, if we have a loss of our motor skills, we may need some help with how we wipe after a BM. If the client is a male client, maybe how you avoid your bladder changes. If self-cathing is involved, then okay, does this person have the fine motor skills to manage you know, the whole process? So there really is so much that we can do as occupational therapists to help people regain function and honestly identity once they have received a neurological diagnosis or um, undergone a significant neurological injury. You're making me think about the importance of addressing this information in a, in a normal conversation type of way and helping mm -hmm. the person feel comfortable and safe because a lot of, a lot of what you're talking about with basic care. We're, I mean, uh, when I say the word basic, that doesn't, it, I think it's a big deal. And I don't want people to think that I'm minimizing that mm -hmm. because if we can address that and help someone feel more confident in their ability to do it and how they feel mm -hmm. about themselves, mm -hmm. and maybe this is an opportunity to work with a psychologist or, you know, a neuropsych practitioner to help people work through how they feel about their identity so that these things mm -hmm. don't get in the way so that they can find ways to move yes. into um, sleeping better en engaging mm -hmm. in social participation in a way that's meaningful for mm -hmm. them, where they feel safe doing it mm -hmm. and being intimate with mm -hmm. their partner. Yes, there is a wonderful inventory that's available, I believe, through the University of Indiana. Um, it is called the Occupational Performance Inventory of Sexuality and intimacy. It has a very detailed, like a 10 page uh, inventory. Of course, we don't have to go through everyone, but some of the sections that they go over is just basic sexual activity, sexual interest, sexual identity, your 
sexual response, which is the whole arousal orgasm process, how you express yourself, um, sexuality, sexual self view. So if you're talking about sexuality specifically, there is this wonderful open access um, resource through, through the University of Indianapolis, sorry, um, that is available to practitioners or honestly anyone who can use it as a self-assessment. So if there is someone listening who wants to understand, okay, I know my sexual self is not where it used to be. I want to be a better partner, a better husband, wife, just have a better sexual relationship with myself. It's something one can download completely free of cost just by registering on the website. And um, Deborah, if you can put it on the show notes, I think that would be very, very helpful. It's a wonderful resource. It's a great way to identify where our difficulties lie. It's a wonderful tool to understand, okay, this is where I want to be. And then kind of, then that's how the clinician and the client figure the process out together. So there's just so much that we can do to help people feel healed and feel independent and competent in so many ways, not just in just their mobility or just their basic ADLs of like dressing, toileting, eating, which are of course important, but sexuality and it, it's such a big part. And again, that is just the sexual inventory, of course. But even with bladder bowel management, there is so much that we can do to foster independence and confidence. I just had a thought that completely escaped me. <laughs> I will add this inventory to the show notes, a link for this. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. A lot of people who have had some sort of a brain injury report wanting to feel like themselves again. When will I feel like yes. myself again? Yes. And so this is why I'm loving what you're saying. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering too, if sometimes we need to accept ourselves where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. That can be a hard thing to do, which is why I think it's important to work with the right healthcare provider, the person sure. who understands yes. that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes, I should definitely make that point that while occupational therapists can help make um, the process of living with a permanent or temporary neurological condition much easier in terms of sexual identity and sexual expression, not all occupational therapists can do that. So that is a very, very important um, point to make. So it's definitely a subspecialty, just like you can call hand therapy <clears throat> or sensory integration therapy. Not all occupational therapy practitioners will do that. So we definitely, the client, it, the onus is a little bit on the individual in identifying the right individual to the right clinician to help them with this process, <clears throat> excuse me. But yes, um, most OTs, again, with a little education, a little Googling, maybe listening to this podcast, they can help find resources for addressing the basics of, you know, how they can help their client manage the pelvic health piece in, in case of like bowel bladder management or just if there is pain involved pain management, that is something that is doable with the basic entry level education, but anything like specific pelvic health treatment in the, so yes, specific pelvic health treatment in the sense of treating the musculature of the area using manual therapy techniques or exercise instruction, instruction and stretches or releases using tools or positioning that kind of treatment requires continuing education. Not every occupational therapist who is registered and licensed is capable of that. Similarly, with this piece of counseling someone with their sexuality requires additional education. So finding someone who has the right credentials is important. Some of the bigger university medical systems often have a department that does this but unfortunately it's not as common as one would hope so yes unfortunately one has to turn to google and trying to ask for recommendations from their current providers to locate someone to help them with this with this process i always think about resources and mm -hmm. you know you mentioned proper training 
So we do have a responsibility as healthcare providers to work within our scope of practice and work within our own abilities. And when we don't have that ability, or if we don't feel comfortable addressing this with one of our patients or a person with, that we're working with, we have a responsibility to them to refer them to someone who does. And exactly. it's not fair. I mean, think about yourself being the person who needs help and how frustrating it can mm -hmm. be when you go from provider to provider to provider and they don't have any idea what you're talking about. It is, it's discouraging. And mm -hmm. I, I just think that it would be such a cool thing if there was some sort of a resource, uh, just an ongoing resource list where we could add this information so that people can get in touch with the providers who mm -hmm. can help them. So, you know, maybe somebody will start that. I don't know. Yes, I don't believe that exists, unfortunately, at this time for sexuality. I know there exists a registry for pelvic health, so because again, depending on the part of the country you are in, you may not, or the world, you may not have a practitioner, occupational therapist, or physical therapist who has the advanced training to address this condition. But if I may share, um, pelvicrehab.com is a wonderful listing of pelvic health practitioners. So there are occupational therapists, physical therapists, a couple MDs, NPs, nurse practitioners who have undergone advanced training to address um, diagnoses, you know, related to pelvic health. However, I don't, I am unaware of what directory that is similar for clinicians addressing sexuality. Yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of one either. I do think though, that as a person who, as a practitioner who has the desire to make sure that your clients are receiving the care that they, they need and they want, presenting them with a big picture of what they may want to address. It, it may not be the right time when you're working with them, depending on where they are in their yeah. health journey, but providing them with some information. So always giving it, making sure that it's available to them. Mm -hmm. And then as the client, start with where you're at, S start mm -hmm. asking. And I, I know mm -hmm. that it's frustrating when people are looking for help and they don't think they're getting the right help that they need, but keep asking. Mm -hmm. I always tell people just keep trying, take another step. Yes. And you'll find somebody amazing like Sujata. Yes. Yep. And if you, if person A didn't have the answer, ask person B in the same setting, you know, someone is going to help you with that. So mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. And providers have as, have as varied experience as, as mm -hmm. the clients that we serve yes. and we all have different levels of knowledge and interest mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just the ways that we do our practice. Yes. yes. I would also like to say, do not be disappointed by the feedback or the response you may get from certain clinicians. For instance, um, I had, I work with a young couple who had seen a sex therapist because they were having very interesting couple, but the one partner, the female partner had vaginismus, which is a condition where there's a spasming of the vaginal tissues with uh, attempts to insert and the male partner had premature ejaculation. So it was such a difficult situation to be in. So that's the thing. When people think of sexuality problems, the only resource most people think of is a sex counselor or a sex therapist. Now, sex therapists typically are more coming from a psychological background where they're trying to help you with the emotional, relational uh, piece of the problem. So how are you relating to your partner? What issues may you have? Do you have any past experiences or thought processes that affect your sexual performance, your sexual desire, things of that nature? But the actual logistics of how do we have sex? How do we be intimate with the um, situation we are in? That is something sex therapists are not really necessarily experts in. So this couple was shown the door saying that there's nothing else to do for you. And this is a young couple in their early 30s. 
So you can just imagine, compound that problem with age or with additional diagnoses, that was just so frustrating. To this couple, the road ahead was, oh, I guess that's it for us. This is the end of the road. So like you said, Deborah, keep asking because there is someone out there who can help you, you know, more than that other person could. So yes, keep asking. Yeah, and one of the things that, we pride ourselves on as occupational therapists is ad- yes. adaptation. And we often recommend adapting the way mm-hmm. people do things. So we have to think about that also as a process. It's a process yes. of change. And one of the things that I think we can do as OT practitioners is support people through mm-hmm. that process. Because, you know, when it comes to sex and sexuality, there is a lot that goes into that. So there, are, you know, you've got cultural exactly. beliefs, you've got religious mm-hmm. beliefs, all mm-hmm. kinds of things like that. And this is kind of funny because Pete always loved that I have an anthropology ah. degree and he was thinking about physical yes. anthropology, but I have ah. a cultural anthropology degree. And this is the stuff that I am mm-hmm. interested in is who we are as people and how we think about things and the ways that we mm-hmm. believe about things. And having that opportunity to look at how we're viewing something and to see is is it my view that's preventing me from right. moving forward mm-hmm. or taking mm-hmm. another step? Because oftentimes that is what mm-hmm. gets in our way. Mm-hmm. And this is why I love the client practitioner relationship, because it's an opportunity for us to work through that right. with them yeah. together. Yeah. And this, I only brought it up um, as a segue from your point about just keep asking. I almost feel it is a responsibility of us occupational therapists to feel more comfortable, especially those of us more inclined to seek out more resources to educate ourselves, because we have that perfect mix of training in mental health modalities, as well as physical health modalities, which individuals need when addressing sexuality. Because with sexual concerns, it's never purely physical. It's never purely psychological. It's always meeting somewhere in the middle. So that toolbox of OT treatment where you can address both kinds and I'm just I'm saying both I'm not even addressing the spiritual piece and such but just a broad umbrella of mental health uh, based interventions as well as physical health based interventions is something I know of only occupational therapists to do and when I work with individuals or couples where there seems to be a significant psychological piece like this individual has and um, an OCD diagnosis, an anxiety diagnosis, I am going to refer them out to a mental health counselor who can solely help them with that piece. However, the logistics of this person has um, is on the autism spectrum or they, are, they have an ADHD diagnosis. They get overwhelmed with the expectation of sexuality on a random Wednesday night. So from my OT point of view, I help them figure their schedule out. Okay, when in your week can we plan this out? Can you and your partner have this system where it's almost a thing like, hey, today is this day and that way the person who's neurodivergent knows to expect that the activity is going to happen and they are better prepared so it's really such a missing piece Deborah and not just in specific like neurological insult or neurological diagnoses but even if you think of neurodivergent individuals addressing their sexuality is such such a big big missing piece that who we think of as sexual health experts like sex therapists or sex counselors they are not equipped to treat treat this or treat it fully, you know? So it's something I really believe very, very strongly that more occupational therapists should consider doing because we are such a wonderful fit for addressing this this specific need of so many people. We are. And the thing that I've figured out over the course of my career is the longer I practice and the more exposure I have to different types of people, different types of diagnoses, different situations that people find themselves in. And the more I learn, the more comfortable I get in my own skills and my ability to communicate with people and just be honest and say, 
I can't help you with this, but mm-hmm. I know someone mm-hmm. who can. And I think that the challenges that we've experienced over the last couple of years with not having as easily accessible health care is showing me how important it is to think differently about these mm-hmm. types of things. And some of this stuff could be addressed oh, through yes. telehealth, like to get someone started, to get yes. to start the communication, open 100%. that door of yes. communication and building that relationship yes. with people yes. and then helping people maybe to not feel so alone and so isolated in their problem. So yeah, for anyone listening who may be a caregiver for someone with a neurological condition, who may be an individual who has sustained a neurological injury or has received a neurological diagnosis, your concerns about your sexuality and sexual expression are not meaningless. They are, you know, worthy of being addressed, being heard and being acted upon. So if people, your doctors or the current care team you have seems dismissive, unfortunately, it just seems that you, the onus is a little bit on you and trying to find someone. The providers are out there. And once again, I, there are definitely occupational therapists who address this. I only say that because there, it's just, it's such a, like a blossoming, a blooming feel. Like people are finally realizing that sexual expression is healthy. It's not something to be hidden away. It's not something to be made feel um, guilty about. And it can help strengthen relationships, not just like with someone else, but within ourselves, you know, understanding and figuring out, okay, what am I as a sexual being makes such a huge difference in our perception of ourselves as a person Mm -hmm. Right? that we see like sexual coaches emerging, we, which is good options are always, always wonderful. But if specifically, I would advise if you do have like a medical condition, then looking for that someone that professional who has the medical background, as well as the additional training to address the sexuality piece would be very beneficial. So yes, um, that's all I wanted to say is that the help is out there. Unfortunately, the onus is on the person or the partner to do a lot of the detective work in trying to find the right fit. I'm glad that you brought up partners, caregivers, care partners, because a lot of times when there is an event, a medical event that has happened in someone's lives, it's easy to get into the um, caregiver role and all of a sudden realize that your own needs aren't getting met. And my, the way I think about this is I think if my needs aren't getting met, then probably my partner's needs aren't getting met either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people, it's easy to fall into complaining. It's easy to fall into Mm -hmm. frustration. Mm -hmm. And I just want to suggest that let's just start talking about Mm -hmm. this stuff. Mm -hmm. If we start talking about it, it can be a healthy resolution. And, you know, the the need for intimacy can be as simple as holding hands. Mm -hmm. I remember, oh my gosh, I can't remember the couple's names, but I just remember the spouse would come to the rehab center every night Mm -hmm. and they would just sit together and hold hands Mm -hmm. in, in the client's room because that was important to them. And I didn't see that level of uh, connection in Mm -hmm. a lot of people that I worked with. Sure. And, you know, we're not going to change people's dynamics. It's not our job to change those, but it is important to meet people where they are and help maybe just give these suggestions. Like, what if you hold hands every day? What if, you know, a hug, it it releases oxytocin Mm -hmm. for one thing, which is really important. Yes. I would say also, unfortunately, I feel a little bit of the problem is also people don't realize that intimacy and connection is still a possibility with a disability or a neurological condition, because we don't see images of people in wheelchairs, older people, people with neurological injuries being sexual, engaging in sexual activity, that we don't think it is in the realm of possibility. However, 
I, I'm, I did share with you, Deborah, and I would, I know Deborah's gonna share the resource with us. There's this wonderful resource of devices, positions, techniques that people with varying abilities, you know, and neurological impairments can use to be as sexually active as they want to be or their partner wants them, or, you know, they, they want to be, I should say, honestly, because um, it really, there are so many possibilities that we just don't know of. There may be a device out there. There may be positioning pillows. There may be things like a vacuum pump, maybe. Mm -hmm. There, if, and of course, these are all adaptations that come once we have established that there is a desire to engage in sexual activity from both partners. And just like you said, Deborah, it doesn't have to be sexual activity. Intimacy can be so much more. It can be laying in the same, same bed together because if it's a significant neurological event, sometimes the injured person has to be in a special bed. Having a spouse in there is difficult figuring out, can I fit in a smaller bed side by side so I can lay with my partner, may not be the whole night, but maybe I can just cuddle them for, you know, a couple hours each day. That is such a wonderful way to regain some of that connection and not always just bracket the partner or the injured partner in the patient role. Yes, they are sick. Yes, they did undergo a major life event in which their abilities have changed, but they are still the person they were before the medical event, before the neurological event. And we want both the person who has undergone the injury as well as their partner, their caregiver to realize that. And we, again, because medical professionals are not trained, it just comes down to that. They're not trained in starting these conversations Clients and their caregivers don't realize it's in the realm of possibility, but it very much is. And especially if it's a long-standing partnership, sexuality and intimacy may or may not be an important part. And depending on that, and if it was an important part, there is a very good way to sustain that and regain some of that with working with the right person. I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about this document that you're talking about that you mentioned mm -hmm. here. Oops, mm -hmm. that's not the right one. It is called Pleasure Able, yes. Sexual Device Manual for Persons with Disabilities. And I will include this in the show notes. I just love the quote that is on the table of contents page. Mm -hmm. It's by S. Gawain, and it says, I am convinced that life in a physical body is meant to be an ecstatic experience. Yes. And it's easy to forget about that when you're, when you're, you don't fully understand what has happened to you. You're not mm -hmm. sure how the rest of your life is going to play out. A lot of times when people have a stroke or a brain injury, their sensation mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. impaired. It's different yeah. than it yes. was before. And you just, it's easy to get into that mindset of, oh my God, my life is over. So maybe initially you know, and the, and the hospital is not the best place mm -hmm. to start this mm -hmm. conversation. I mean, it depends on the, the severity of the injury. Mm -hmm. but I do know that uh, therapists who work in home care have a wonderful opportunity to find out from couples yes. what their intimate relationship is like. Do they have goals for that? And, you know, one of the things with elderly couples, like you were mentioning getting in the bed, if they have a special mm -hmm. bed, well, do we have a partner who has arthritis or who had a hip replacement? Like yes. these are things that people may be afraid to ask us about that we can just offer uh, solutions to. And it, it could be like a whole world opening up for people. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. At the same time, like we mentioned, we touched upon sooner. I would not broach the conversation if I'm not comfortable for receiving the responses I may get, because you have to understand your biases. And I, I would hate for that to happen when a clinician who doesn't feel fully competent to address it, receives a response and then puts forth a judgment that may be damaging to the client and their relationship. That's an excellent point right there. I actually, this came up in a Facebook group that I'm in for occupational therapy practitioners where 
I think it was somebody who's learning mm-hmm. OT and they found out that this is oh, a yeah. thing, you know, sexuality and they acknowledge their discomfort yes. with the topic. And yes. I, I was just reading some of the therapist responses. Well, this has never come up and, um, you know, in all the years that I've been practicing, it never comes up, but maybe people want it to come up and they're afraid to ask. And, you know, my thought on that is allow it to come up if it comes up and Uh you, you can be very benign in your response and helpful at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the skills, you can say, I don't feel confident to address your concerns. I will refer you to someone who does. It's just like when the, um, it's when the department of health comes into your facility, Mm-hmm, I know mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. to find that answer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I do think too, one of the most healing responses that people can receive is an acknowledgement of what they've, of their concern. Yes. Oh yes, definitely. Definitely. And like you said, Debra, it happens from both sides, right? Change can happen mm-hmm. with all stakeholders pushing the envelope further and further. So us as healthcare providers and professionals, educators, we need to take the onus of educating ourselves to meet all the needs of people, not just the needs of people that we are comfortable addressing. So just like you said, I will find someone to help you with that. I will not ignore it because I don't feel comfortable talking about it. I really, oh, I appreciate this. I appreciate you joining me to talk about this so much. When you're talking about this, it makes me wonder, how did you get interested in this topic and how did you pursue the path that you're on? Because I think you worked with the population that I have worked with as well. Yes, it was a very, very organic transition. I worked in very conventional adult rehab between skilled nursing, subacute rehab, and I transitioned to home health. I actually transitioned to pelvic health initially after I became pregnant, and I discovered also the absolute lack of resources in having a healthy pregnancy. Beyond showing up to the medical appointments, I had received no direction in how to be healthy physically and emotionally to give birth and have my life completely appended, right? With this new human being I'd be responsible for. So that's what sent me to educating myself. I practice in pelvic health. So that's why I've been doing pelvic health for four years. And then sexuality would keep coming up because I'd be working with people who were now leaking and they didn't feel sexy. They were like, I can't wear my thong anymore. I have to wear a liner or they have a pain condition and they cannot tolerate insertion or now they had prostate surgery and their erection quality is much, much poorer. So as a consequence of working in pelvic health, addressing sexuality began became almost so necessary, which is why I began going back to my OT education, seeking out more educational resources to address this um, very, very niche area of practice. But that's how I got into it, just from working in pelvic rehab and also understanding that I can help people just through problem solving also kind of going back to my OT base where it doesn't all have to be exercise and adaptations and modifications. Sometimes it is kind of piecing together the picture of what is this person's identity? What are their beliefs? What are their desires? How that has changed with the life event that they have undergone and how to bring them to where they need to be. So yes, that is how I got to doing what I do. So I do um, within the state of Florida where I'm licensed and currently New York also, I will see people in person do hands-on treatment and give, it changes a little how you can, um, it's great for sure the area between occupational therapy and wellness care, but I do um, sexual, and sexuality coaching to people everywhere online and practice and see clients in person in Florida. So I wonder, can we talk a little bit about what it might look like to work with a person who has a pain issue? Now, I just want to toss this out there. Vaginal pain is very common. 
Mm -hmm. I learned, believe it or not, I learned about this in anthropology school and I already had an associate's degree as an occupational therapy assistant. And I never heard that before. Mm. And I learned about it in anthropology school Mm -hmm. and it is a common problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, you're talking about some leaking urinary leaking, and you're talking about pain during intercourse. And you've talked about less potent erections. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. what, what would someone, what could they expect from working with you for those issues? Sure. So I will say from me personally, my skills are those of a pelvic rehab therapist, meaning I can do hands-on manual therapy. I can instruct in exercises and stretches, and I can educate in resources as well as that of a sexual counselor, where I can identify the psychological factors going into the condition. Not every clinician you see may have both of those skill sets. You may be seeing a pelvic therapist who doesn't have the sexuality, the sexual counseling background, or you may be seeing a sexual counselor who doesn't have the pelvic therapy background. So when someone sees me, I always start with, okay, what do you want to focus on today and what your primary goal is? And we set up a secondary goal also. So it really depends on the condition. So for the person with pain, for instance, I initially, and for pain and even the male client who may be having erectile issues, both of those individuals, I start off with saying, we are going to abstain from interpersonal even with trialing sexual intercourse, like penis and vagina sex, penis and anus sex, we are not doing it for X amount of time. And we set that timeline. And during that time, we explore other ways of being intimate. While we work on the pain piece, while we work on the erectile strength piece, or the erectile the refractory duration, which we call if we are dealing with PT, premature ejaculation. So while we are treating the root of their problem, we start adapting their interpersonal relationship. And I say, okay, we are going to abstain from the expectation of sex or sex as we have known it for this long while we do other methods of intimacy. So we try and identify what is this couple's in lay terms, what is their love language? How do they express love? How do they like to receive love? How do they like to be sexually intimate? Because again, that's two different things. So that is how we would go about it while side by side addressing their pain issue if it's pain through again, specific manual therapy like myofascial release work or visceral manipulation, actually working on their muscles, their fascia to bring about structural change that may be causing the pain, that may may be causing the leaking, that may be causing the poor erections. So you will address the actual physical issues or concerns while side by side. And that starts building people's confidence back up or identity in that I am not like not sexy. I am still a good wife. I'm still a good husband. I'm still a good boyfriend, like whatever they may, their self-image may be because they can take care of their partners. And that's the thing. That's how it's very, very interesting. This work, when someone comes with a sexual concern, it's less so their issue. It's more like I can't take care of my partner is often Mm. the concern. So we start there that, and also that's where we start. We are going to meet your partner's concern because a, no one has any issues with that (laughs) while we work. Yes. While we work on that's such a good point. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, as humans, I hear people complain about partners sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, when you work in an office, you hear those things Mm -hmm. and you hear people complain, but everybody still wants to be able to do four. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's what we focus on, you know, and we tell them that that's how, especially if it's a new relationship or I work with people who were still dating, who weren't in committed relationships. And again, they were feeling like, less manly because they couldn't be as sexually active as they were before. So I coach them through this, like we are going to make your person of interest to your partner, the focus of this activity. We are going to say, I'm going to take care of you. I want to focus on you. And again, no one has a problem with that. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing that you said was self-image. And as you're talking about self-image and our confidence abilities, 
it made me realize how we are as humans when there's one thing that is different. Mm -hmm. We might have all, you know, we do have all of these other aspects to our lives. And when that one thing changes, it's like our brain goes into overdrive, reminding us all the time. And then we start to feel less than. Yes. And it doesn't matter if other people view us that way. If we view ourselves that way, it almost seems like there's no amount of convincing Oh yes. that can change that. Yes. I can see how that is such an easy um, fit to fall into because almost every interaction you're having outside of your social circle is addressing that condition or that new disability. So you think you have become that. It's very easy to forget that this new diagnosis, this new condition is a part of your life. It is not your whole life. So that is also a conversation I have with my clients in the very beginning. And I tell them, this is why I will, I, when I set as a clinician, I send, I expect my clients to do a home exercise program or a home program, but I tell them you will do this two to four times a week. I don't want this to overtake your life. And as clinicians, that's a very important thing to set. Five days a week, seven days a week, unrealistic. Do you as a person work out seven days a week? Thank you. you. Oh my (laughs) gosh. Thank you for just saying that out loud. So unrealistic. So I tell my clients that you are a person. You are not a sick person. You are a person with a sickness. I want you to remember that. And I want you to make time for your hobby. I want you to make time for going, eating lunch outside, get some sun, feel good. And then on these three days, we figure out which days you are going to do these exercises for me. And then next week, you will tell me how that went. And then we go from there. I love that. It feels so much more doable. Yes, exactly. Achievable. It is achievable. And that's the part that's going to help with the improvement. That's, that's the part that over time where the change is going to occur. And if it doesn't feel achievable, it's easy to say, Oh my gosh, I can't, there's no way I just can't. And then you don't even start. And we don't want to put people in that position. Yes. The other thing is you can tell, you can tell as the practitioner, if it's being done, if people are being truthful with you, because that is when the change occurs and it's, yes. And those are the people that have the most success, I think are Mm -hmm. the people that follow through with their home program. And so it's just, I really love that you're thinking in terms of real life, especially with people who've had a stroke because it takes longer. Everything takes longer, especially if they have physical limitations, you know, they use up Mm -hmm. more energy. Oh, yes. And everything is so can feel so much heavier. Right. And you don't want it to be that way. So this is uh, just a note for the clinicians, students who may be listening, is that truly we collaborative in the care in that you don't prescribe exercise, you recommend them. And then you set a duration based on the client's abilities and their life schedules. So I will ask them, okay, this is what I need you to do. How many times this week do you think you'll be able to do it? Or how many times before you see me next, do you think you'll be able to do it? And we put that down. So we are not starting off with failure. We are not like, oh, the therapist told me five times a week. And then the person then is left with, I did not do this. I am not even doing things I should to better myself. And it just sends people into this whole cycle of, you know, self-blame that is not serving our interest of getting them better. Oh my gosh. Yes. I just did, um, I I participated in a study group with Mm -hmm. a a bunch of amazing practitioners and we Mm -hmm. created a constraint, a modified constraint induced therapy program. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up when we were talking about this Mm -hmm. is non-compliance on the end of, of the people. I hate that word. I hate that word too. (laughs) And it, it, it's so cool. This is why I love being part of a group because you're mm-hmm. hearing other people talk and you hear yourself in mm-hmm. others. Yes. And then, but when you're kind of on the outside listening, you can get a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me then that if somebody 
is doing their exercise program, their home program, whatever it is they're assigned for those three days. Mm -hmm. And maybe they wanted to do five, but they didn't get to five, but they did three. That's three more days that they, they would have done that they wouldn't have done, but that they did Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't have done Mm -hmm. if they didn't meet with you. Yes. Yes. And that is progress. That is amazing progress. Yes. So honestly, it is not my client's duty or role to comply to what I say. Oh, you know, thank you. <laughs> no one needs to comply by my, no, no, that is just something, it's a partnership, you know, I am not an authority figure, I hate the word compliance in that sense, no, we just throw compliance out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. I, you know, too, um, it's pretty cool being the practitioner, because when your client comes back, if they're honest with you, well, I did it two days, but not three. Yes. Oh, well, what happened? What, you know, what, and you can talk about it and figure that out. Like, yes. was it just a random thing? Did something come up this week? Because real life is happening at home and you can decide, is this, do we need to work around this, figure out something different or mm-hmm. should we try it again? And, and th- you know, they're telling you, and yep. you're really, you're helping, you're helping them to see the big picture of their life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, yeah. Yes, definitely. So yeah, um, again, it really, to just to kind of summarize for the listeners, for the listeners who are clinicians, A, yes, the onus is on you to bring up sexuality, sexual function. If you can't address it, find someone who can. Google is wonderful. Uh, If you feel the inclination to definitely educate yourself on addressing sexuality further, it is a very, very much, much, much needed topic of, you know, um, rehabilitation that needs to be addressed. Um, throw compliance out of the window. It's a terrible idea (laughs) that our clients need to comply by what we say, right? They are hiring us and we, if anything, we are duty bound to comply by their needs, you know, not the other way around. So um, anyhow, and as an individual who may be, uh, who may now find themselves living with a neurological condition or recovering from one, know that there there is help out there. It may need some searching, some looking for, but do not give up. Do not take like, oh, that boat has sailed, you know, with feeling pleasure in or feeling less pain, not even pleasure. Often for people, it's just that I just don't want to hurt anymore or I just want to meet my partner's needs. If you have concerns of that nature, know there is help out there. You may need to look for um, it a bit, but it is out there. And again, your abilities in this realm, again, are a part of your whole identity. You can, yes, in a way, you can still be the person you were with, you know, with changes to the changes to how you used to do things. So even if maybe and truly you're not interested in engaging in sexuality, you can still maintain intimacy in other ways, or you can find other solutions. You just have to find the right person to help you have those conversations with yourself then with your partner. So um, that really is all I have to say. I feel like we would, we could go on talking about this for so, so long because there are not enough, yeah, there are not enough conversations happening about this and there really need to be more. So, yeah. I know. So I'm going to put your information on the show notes. If people want to reach out to you, and learn more about the services that you provide. Thank you. And um, I just, I thank you so much because I I feel like the more conversations, we just have these conversations, Mm -hmm. we are going to normalize this and bring more joy. Yeah, people's exactly, lives. Exactly, exactly. So even the quote you shared, um, Deborah, about how being in a physical body should be an ecstatic experience and ecstasy, not just in a sexual way, but just in everyday living. Like, why are we not going for joy? You know, why are we not going for ecstasy? Mm-hmm. So yes, that's such a wonderful thought. Thank you, Deborah. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. We appreciate your support and would love to hear from you. 
ask us questions and share your thoughts by email at nogginsandneurons at gmail.com. That's noggins, the word and, spelled out, neurons at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please share this podcast with others you think will benefit. Also be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll catch you next time on Noggins and Neurons, Stroke and TBI Recovery Simplified.